Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Today, our guest is Wilford Riley. He's a professor of political science at Kentucky State University, which is a historically black college. I'm leading with that fact because he's got a new book called Hate Crime Hoax, How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War. And I don't want anybody to get lost in the book being mired in right-wing ideology. There are two things that we've learned about book titles with all the authors we've had on this show. One, they're usually influenced pretty heavily, if not picked outright, by the publishers. And two, there are keywords that publishers know will trigger a response by audiences, and among them are left, right, God, and the F word. So what I'm saying is, before you think you know what this book, or this guest is all about, think again. Dr. Riley is a deep thinker who uses data to reach conclusions, and he and our brother Dr. Rich Lede really go after the impact of hate crimes in America, with Pete serving as instigator, referee. You're really going to dig this conversation with our guest today, Dr. Wilfred Riley. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is uh, Dr. Wilfred Riley. I'm an associate professor of political science at Kentucky State University, Frankfort, Kentucky. I'm the author of the book Hate Crime Hoax, as well as the $50 million question. Glad to be here on the Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. How's it going, guys? It's going great. And also, I have a fellow political scientist in-house. We have Dr. Richard Lede making about his one millionth appearance on the show. And for those of you who don't know, Rich and I have done a lot of work in Afghanistan. But what Rich does now at Troy University in Alabama is, well, he teaches students about things. But he and I work on trying to understand conflict a lot more and, and get better at it. So... Welcome, Rich. And of course, welcome, Will. This is going to be an interesting conversation because, Will, you're sort of, I guess if I was going to be really unfair and brief, you don't play to type. Like You say things that are based in fact and make us think, and I imagine that you get hell from both sides of the equation. Fairly often, yeah, which I don't really care about any more than I think you guys do. No. <laughs> uh, but a focus, a focus of my research is using modern quantitative methods, particularly different varieties of regression in Stata, but a variety of them, to test sort of sacred cow theories on the right and the left. So, I mean, among other things, I've looked at whether white privilege exists once you adjust for other variables like region of the country, city size, IQ. I've challenged the alt-right. I had a pretty famous regionally televised debate with Jared Taylor, where I called into question some of their claims on IQ. I mean, as you probably know, if you think IQ has value, the tested IQ for white groups like Irishmen has increased from about 79, let's say, during Army Alpha basic testing during World War I, World War II, to 102 today. I don't think there's any genetic way that could have happened. Hate crime hoax is an offshoot of that line of research where essentially, I mean, you're just doing cross-tabs analysis, really, for this book, but where I look at what percentage of widely reported recent hate crimes were fakes, and where I analyze about 100, 110 specific fake stories that were very high-profile that made the news. So, I mean, many, many recent high-profile hate crimes, I'm not going to say most or almost all, that wouldn't be true, but a whole bunch of them, from Jussie Smollett to Yasmin Saweed, Air Force Academy, Eastern Michigan, Going back, Duke Lacrosse, Tawana Brawley, coming forward, Key in College, Wisconsin Parkside. These have been straight up total fakes. So I was curious about why that was. I break down each case and I try to analyze it from a polls or even a psychological perspective. That's this book. That wasn't the fifty thousand dollar question book, right? No, that was that's hoax. hoax. Okay, hoax, the hoax one. Okay. Well, first of all, I think this is fascinating that you would kind of go after some of. It's an interesting. Interesting line of research. I'm going to go after some of these big things that everybody says or all these big controversies. Where are you pulling your data from? Just well, tell depends. me a little bit about the data that you're using. For the book, Hate Crime Hoax? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for hoax, they, I mean, this definitely was an academic work, but the data analysis wasn't as complex as that in, for example, the $50 million question. Mm. So okay. for hoax, I was really interested in simply how many hate crime hoaxes there were. 
because this is something that was extremely contested to what struck me as a surprising politicized degree. Mm -hmm. So you had researchers like Brian Levine, who does good work from what I've been able to see, but who claims that a minuscule portion of uh, hate crime complaints turn out to be fake. I recall his claim is 0.03 or 0.003%. So I mean, 0.003% would be three in 10,000 if I have the math correct. Right. That didn't sound accurate. Uh, on the other hand, you have conservative um, scholars, you might use a quote mark, but Dinesh D'Souza and Coulter, who've said most of these are fake, who will tweet, uh, you know, this is going to be fake every time you see a hate crime in the media. And I thought that the truth was almost certainly somewhere in the middle. So what I did was simply use standard internet tools of analysis. I mean, Google and advanced search, Bing, JSTOR, I looked through a period of about 10 years and I just looked at how many reported, nationally reported or nationally or regionally reported serious hate crime hoax stories there were. My data set right now, which I'll probably send you guys after this, is 618 cases. And while I want to emphasize that those are not totally in the past five years, they're concentrated in the past five years, which was my research period. So I've got 618 of them. And between... Specifically, 2012 and early 2018, when the book came out, or when the book was sent into the publisher, I've got around 400. So I, I look at the number of these hate crime hoaxes that occurred, and I find out it's not 0.003%. <laughs> right. It's also not all of them. Uh, it's a substantial <laughs> number of a larger data set, which is what I expected to find from the beginning. And then you can analyze why this is happening. Then you can analyze, yeah. so, okay, what's the actual percentage? But essentially, just I used internet search tools. I found the cases. Um, I compiled a book and an Excel and state a spreadsheet based on the cases. Mm -hmm. How many hate crimes go unreported, be they a hoax or not? <laughs> well, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, so all of this stuff, the numbers are just up in the air. Mm -hmm. um, what I use is the FBI data set, the annual data set that consists of all reported hate crimes. Right. Uh, yeah, that would right. include any hoaxes yeah. or probable hoaxes. That would include cases that produce a conviction and cases that don't. Beyond that, I mean, I guess you could look at the Bureau of Justice Statistics annual crime data to see how many people reported that they were a victim of a hate crime. And from that, calculate the percentage of hate crimes that are reported to the police. In general, as I understand from last year's BJS, 46% uh, of all crimes were reported to the police. Mm -hmm. And that was fairly consistent along most crimes, although not obviously for sexual assault, for example. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't tackle that. I don't look at we're only 42% of hate crimes reported. That might be something to look at in the future for other researchers to look at. What I look at is specifically out of the FBI data pool, how many uh, hate crimes turned out to be hoaxes. And I, I suppose there are a couple of different levels of analysis here. So first, I have 618 hoaxes. Second, those are concentrated, more than 400 of the hoaxes in about a five-year period. Uh, the past five years is a good casual way to describe that. So the response from, say, a Dr. Levine could be, well, over five years, there are, you know, 35,000 hate crimes reported to the police, and you've found, you know, less than 1,000 hoaxes. That's still a minuscule percentage. There are a couple of problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the most basic is that only about 8 to 10 percent of hate crime cases receive national or significant yeah. regional reporting. Right. Yeah. So, and you can empirically measure that. If you scroll through the first hundred pages of Google search results and you Google hate crime 2016, you're not going to find 7,000 cases. You're going to find about 500. I, I generously estimate that about 10% of cases are reported to the level where an ethical researcher could find them. So that would be about 3,500 cases over a five year period where I have, say, 400 hoaxes. So you've got a simple. Uh, proven hoax rate over 10%. I estimate about 15% in the book. The second level of that, though, is that the conviction rate in hate crime cases is extremely low. Yeah. So in the other 85% of reported hate crime cases, you don't have convictions, which tends to be the assumption on the left side of this debate. 
So Dr. Levine, for example, is taking the full data set of hate crime allegations and saying, well, out of those, you're only discovering a certain amount, let's say 1% of proven fake. The issue is that most of those 3,500, or he would argue 35,000 cases, don't lead to convictions either. Uh, in California in 2016, which is the most recent big state data I have, I like larger data sets, but I mean, you had 931 reported felony or a misdemeanor hate crime. But of those, only 220 even went forward to the prosecution, which is a fairly basic standard meeting. We don't think it's a hoax. We have any kind of suspect in mind. And of those, 51 produced convictions. So the conviction rate in hate crime cases that I've been able to analyze in STATA is about 6 to 7%. Whereas the proven hoax rate is about 15%. That's <laughs> the most conclusive data estimate that I have so far. Man, I don't know. I got a lot of questions. I'm, I'm trying not to te I treat this like a, uh, like a job talk you know, interview where okay. people just slam your, slam your methodology. But I'm just generally fascinated. I'm glad you brought up the levels of analysis stuff, though. Because that's I think, is important for the listeners to understand because it speaks to, well, how, how you you can use the data that you have effectively, okay. you know, and, and I do appreciate you. And again, for the listeners being very transparent about your data sources and how you're, how you're using the data, but is this a social media problem that's blowing up? Cause man, hate crimes are bad. The fact that it's hard time to get convictions for hate crimes, that's bad too. But has our new media environment it just exploded this situation? So now we've got you know, hate crimes happening, and they're just getting more attention than they might have gotten in the past, but specifically more national level attention. Yeah, and maybe I, mean, I guess I think, I'm talking about hate crimes in general, whether they're hoaxes or not, you know, well, I think that there are almost two papers there. For the first one, I mean, so yeah, you can analyze or even criticize data collection techniques for most projects, including this one. I mean, what I really did was fairly simple. I mean, I found out that there are, let's say, 7,000 reported hate crimes per year. I looked, I did some pretty intense Google and Bing analysis, I think, and I found out, you know, almost exactly 10% of those received national or regional reporting. In that same kind of 100-page result set, I found that, you know, going back through the years I analyzed, you've got 600-plus hoaxes. And then, I mean, to some extent, you could argue, did you just divide 600 by 3,500? Well, kind of. I mean, but that's the percentage of proven hoaxes yeah. that I've got. Now, some of this other stuff, like the question of how many hate crimes go unreported, that's a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. I don't tackle that in the book. That needs to be yeah. tackled. Yeah, I mean, these are, again, talking to a professional, yeah, that's stuff people need to look at. Yeah. And uh, you know, hopefully I'll get a contract for another one. <laughs> well, that <laughs> doesn't, that question wasn't to take away from of course, no. your book, but it's really to illustrate how complicated this stuff can yes, be. Yes. Because you've only got the known universe. You, you don't yeah. know what the unknown universe looks like. Because it's just, and you brought up, you brought up, you know, I think sexual assaults is unreported crimes. That's one mm -hmm. of the most frequently unreported crimes. Yeah. You know, so this is a very, very complicated line of research in general. But you got to figure out where to start. You got to start somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, and I started with the simplest, most widely available data set, very bluntly, the FBI data. Now, I will say there's no particular reason from a research hypothesis, null hypothesis perspective to assume that the false reporting rate would be dramatically lower or higher among you know higher profile, lower profile, even to some extent unreported cases. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you're looking at 15%, I think that is a low end estimate. I'm treating everything that's not a confirmed hoax as essentially to some extent valid, but the conviction rate in that set of cases is 7%. So, I mean, in reality, you're absolutely right that there's one ambiguous universe of how many cases there are. That's correct. There's another ambiguous universe of how many of these cases that I'm treating as valid actually happen, if we want to be blunt. I mean, when you look at sexual assaults, this is a very touchy topic, especially since we, we all seem to be men. I don't want to assume from everyone's beard and so on i'm a man but, you know the sexual assault is a very <laughs> underreported crime and men and women need to work to change that it's also one of the more frequently falsely reported crimes yeah there's a book the campus rape frenzy out that i think frankly comes oh. from a right or center right wing perspective 
but where they make the point that perhaps only six or eight percent of rapes are intentionally falsely reported, but that if you're looking at these collegiate standards of, you know, more than three drinks is rape, as we teach our young men here, a very large percentage of these crimes would not be effectively prosecutable in any jurisdiction. So it's accurate to say that half or less of all sexual assaults are reported, but it's also accurate to say that perhaps half of all reported sexual assaults are prosecutable. And I think you're seeing the same thing with hate crimes. I mean, there's probably the standard 46 or whatever percent reporting rate, but of those that are reported, you've got a 7% conviction rate. So, I mean, I think to some extent, I don't want to be the guy that calls for more research, but yeah, people need to, people need to look at, you know, what percent are unreported. People need to look at what per, why cases in that 93% were dismissed. Are we talking no lay proseccis on the one hand when this may very well not have happened? Or are we talking about a witness so brutalized they don't want to come forward? So yeah, I think that there's a pretty intensive analysis you can do of all these data sets. And I hope people do it. I plan to do some of this for, you know, Midwest political science, American, you know, but uh, obviously once the topic's been brought forward, yeah. once... Once reasonable scholars say, look, no, we're not talking about three cases, but also, you know, and Dinesh, we're not talking about 7,000. <laughs> we're talking about 500. The question then becomes, what do we do with the other cases? How do we encourage more reporting? I mean, so there's obviously there's analysis to be done there. So I, I want to bring up the point that you, you said it was a delicate issue talking about sexual assault, but you're also <laughs> a guy that deals in race and hoaxes, white privilege. So, uh, uh how <laughs> yes, that just well, I we started talking about it anyway. I mean, I'm not I'm not the most tactful guy, and I don't necessarily think you gentlemen are either. It's not the most tactful show. You know what's yeah. funny though is that you see these two big bearded white dudes. Our most recent pu peer-reviewed published paper is a paper about female empowerment. And, and okay. <laughs> so it's a feminist paper from a couple of dudes. And ethics. Yeah, and <laughs> ethics. Got a yeah, big bearded deal. black guy on the show now. So you know <laughs> wait, black you're black? Well, that's some diversity. Me... We're all males, and but <laughs> you know, oh. I want to I want to get back to this some of this number stuff and I I man, I'm sorry if I'm touching on your toes, Pete, because if I'm stepping on your toes, but you're talking about statistics and how you gathered your data and all this and you got the left versus the right and the rhetoric coming from the left, the rhetoric coming from the right. When the actuality is what's happening is somewhere in the middle, right? right. Now it could lean left or it could lean right, but in the midst of all this like missing data problem and you know what well the unreported cases in this case in this uh conversation how do you like first of all you got the problem of identifying this gap between rhetoric and reality which it seems like your book is but how do you show people you know how do you show them well other than writing a book you know how do you explain to people that there's a gap here between the rhetoric that you hear on the left and right this is the reality of the situation because one thing I'm big on is we need policy, mm -hmm. you know, policy can f help us fix or, you know, address some of the negative consequences of this stuff. So how do we move in that direction where we're, we're coming to agreement about where the gap is here between the rhetoric and the reality? I frankly think that honest reporting and defining our terms, two of the basic rules in real science and real journalism, that has to be where you start. I mean, to a certain extent, there's an element of hilarity here where one side is estimating 0.3%, let's say, of the cases are fakes. The other side is estimating 100%. And the reality <laughs> seems to be 10 to 15%. There is a figure that's measurable in the middle. I say 15, you could, I mean, you can look at my data and take some out, add cases to the data set. But there is an empirical reality that actually exists, in my opinion. I'm not a postmodernist at all in most situations. <laughs> So if you look at 7,000 hate crimes in a typical year, and you find that 727 are nationally reported, and you find that 113 of those are fakes, then you have produced data. You have found something reasonably close to knowledge. It might be that the, per the possible number of hoaxes could be 100 to 200, but it can't be 727 and it can't be three. So I mean, I do think that this book is an attempt to produce some real data out there so that people can kick it around and people can talk about it and people can say, you know, Riley focused on these years, perhaps, or Riley needs to deal with unreports in his next book. But now there's data. There's not just a guy saying they're all fakes on Twitter. Yeah. And yeah. I think to some extent, that's kind of the debate you've been having around a lot of these issues. A lot of these race issues seem to break down to big brother and big Republican guy yelling at each other on television. 
And there's not necessarily a lot of evidence. The white privilege example, I think, is another example of this. I mean, what are the facts? You know, on a one to 100 point scale of satisfaction, which is what I use, how do whites score versus blacks? So a lot of these things are empirical questions. And I, this, this book is an attempt to answer one of those empirical questions. My next book, by the way, Alt-Wrongs, is targeted at the alt-right, which I think is sort of an attempt by amateurs to present as scientists. So, I mean, I think there's a lot there to, for example, the alt-right seems confused about the fact that if you want to use genetic race at all, whites are Caucasians. <laughs> so you can't argue for the genetic superiority of whites without showing that Caucasians as a group tend to outperform other racial groups. You'd have to show this about Afghanistan, Moldova, Borat's country. You can't do it. So, I mean, I think that these empirical questions have a lot of value. So there's an element of critique about how I asked the empirical question, perhaps. But the fact is that someone needed to ask it. I think the book's a good start. And I hope people respond to the book. I hope, for example, Dr. Levine or someone on the left side of this debate who's good says, well, no, these are the weaknesses in this data set. And then you move into a serious debate, but it's not, again, Ann Coulter on Twitter. Not to criticize Ann, who I've is likable by all accounts. Yeah, you know, I, I want to ask you. It's funny because we, you know, you have to define terms, right? Yeah. What is white? Because I've been in areas where I've seen Turkish dudes that are as brown as can be, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm white." Like, okay, well, now I got a problem because white is <laughs> hard to define, right? And you're 100 percent right. The, uh, you know, Caucasian. There's an Asian in that word, and there's a root <laughs> there. So, <laughs> what are we talking well, about? You know, I mean, a casual friend of mine is an executive with 23 and me, and I've met other people who work for that company. I'm not claiming any significant knowledge of their processes, processes, but my understanding is that what 23 and me finds with these genetic background tests, they're really haplotype tests, is that they're 22 to 25, which along with the number of human components of the human genetic code, I think is the source of their name. But they're 22 to 25 human population groups like Iberian white. Sure. And those break down into five or six larger cross haplotype populations. And it seems to me, even though this is politically incorrect, there's no real reason not to call those races. Once you get down to, okay, we've got six large human groups that contain 24 smaller human groups that you can break into blacks, Amerindians, and so on. So that does seem to be a reality. Uh, a Caucasian is simply... What's the, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into cranium shapes and all that. I mean, it's the, it's the non-Black, non-Asian group represented among the three largest haplotypical racial groups. What, the other but, thing I mean, about a lot that. of the things that alt-writers argue, for example, that there's a sharp genetic distinction between Northwestern Europeans and other whites, like Eastern Europeans, uh, Af Middle Easterners are all technically Caucasian. Iranians, Afghans, Iraqis in the American climate look like dark-skinned white guys. They look like Italians. That's so, why. I mean, <laughs> the Caucasian is simply the broad racial group, uh, you know, angular noses, straighter hair, so on, that would include whites. But the argument that there's a distinction in performative terms between Caucasians and whites seems to be kind of baseless. You can't argue that Moldova, where most of the people are blonde, is a struggling country because somehow it's not a white country. <laughs> what most American conservatives seem to mean by white is Northwestern European, never touched by Islam. Yeah. Um, it, but that's a meaningless yeah. scientific no. categorization. But, yeah, you could do this all day, like go and, and let uh, you know an Israeli Jewish guy know that he's a Semite just like his Egyptian brother, you know, when they come from the same set. Like, yeah, and they're not white to the Italian guy who's not white to, yeah, to the Swedish guy and on and on and on. It, yeah, white is a pretty shitty description for something that we get so mad at. All I know is the Afghans thought I was an Afghan. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've, I had never been to Afghanistan until I went to Afghanistan and seeing Rich wear, <laughs> wear a traditional me, headdress there in <laughs> Afghanistan, I was convinced that he was from Afghanistan because we literally <laughs> saw a guy that looked exactly like his uncle. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get over it. No, you're you're right though. Um, but but you're asking people to exercise a little bit of constraint, you know, and ideological constraints not something that a lot of Americans are well familiar with or capable of in my opinion that's just my opinion that is not the opinion of my university i did not say the american okay. citizen is not smart i did not say that 
I implied something more sinister. Let, let me ask you a question, Dr. Riley. So okay. we have this hoax knowledge. Do you have a sense for which one costs us the most in terms of civil disobedience or some kind of social problem? Is it the hate crime themselves, the unconvictable nature of hate crimes, or are the hoaxes the worst? Is it a cry wolf thing? You know, you do it too many times, it's going to lose its effectiveness. What, what, what are some of these costs? Well, the costs, uh, so first of all, I mean, that's an interesting and very tough question. I mean, what causes more of an issue for race relations, hate crimes or hate crime hoaxes? I would probably say hate crime hoaxes because in most major hoax cases, you first have the turmoil and the marches and occasionally the riots that would accompany the act if it were real. And then you have the reveal that it's not real and the backlash anger from middle classers, conservatives, whites, and the like. The cost of a lot of these is very high. If you look at the Jussie Smollett case, which, by the way, as always, thank you, Jussie Smollett, helping me sell some books here. Yes. Jussie Smollett's hoax took place <laughs> in the city I'm from, yeah. Chicago. Yeah. In a neighborhood where probably a fourth of my friends live, yes. Streeterville, our young professional neighborhood. Yes. And it was, it was exposed as a hoax literally a week before my book dropped. Yeah. So just oh. unbelievable coincidence. I mean, I was on... Tucker Carlson, some of the big black shows, Nick Truth Report, so on, the day afterward, talking about what this means for America and so on. But at any rate, banter aside, I mean, obviously, the cost of that was extraordinarily let, high. Let me break in, because I want you to say, get back to the banter aside. I also have some roots in Chicago. I've lived there and everything else. And the right. moment anybody from Streeterville or that who knows the neighborhoods, the moment that story comes out, you're like, <laughs> not a chance in hell. Like, yeah. nothing about it rang true, you know? the yeah. time of night, how cold it was, the presence of MAGA wear and ruffians? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Streeterville, for those that don't know Chicago, Streeterville is, I think you'd say it's fair to say, our young professional neighborhood. Yes. Probably 15% upper middle class black. Chicago's got a very large black community, 10% gay. I mean, there's a club life at the bases of the giant buildings. At 2 o'clock in the morning, there are going to be plenty of people outside. Chicagoans know how to dress for the cold. We don't leave our faces exposed when it's negative 20. Yeah, the entire idea that that attack occurred in that neighborhood was fantastical. <laughs> it would be equivalent to me saying right now, I'm, I'm an anti-racist. I get along with most people. But right now, I live in a fairly scrappy white neighborhood in Kentucky. It's called South Frankfurt. The, this would be equivalent to me saying in my neighborhood, I went outside to work on my car and five black Muslims <laughs> who nobody had stopped, nobody had confronted jumped out from behind a poplar tree and just kicked my ass. <laughs> I fought all five of them off. I mean, you guys have been in a violent encounters. You know how uh, implausible that is. Yes. I fought all five of them off like I was Hercules. And then I just went back into my house and that was the end of it. Like, if I said that, people would say, well, that's obviously a lie. Yeah. That's a working class Caucasian neighborhood in Kentucky. <laughs> right. You're a scrappy enough guy, Riley, but you didn't beat up five people. <laughs> I got my eye scratched. To see this. I got a scratch <laughs> on my cheek. He had a turkey sub in his hand. Yeah. Come on. I mean, like, just, yes, that was a ridiculous story. But because of what the narrative is, and we've all challenged the narrative at different points during this conversation, but because there are certainly things that in a middle, middle class cocktail party setting, you are not allowed to say in America. And that's as true for politicians and policemen as it is for anybody else. Because of that, the city spent weeks and millions of dollars pursuing this fantasy yeah. as though it happened. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that detective, it's my understanding because they told me, but that detective level CPD officers were pulled off other cases and were forced to look through all the surveillance footage from every building in this area to see who had attacked Smollett. And I mean, inevitably, it turned out to be two buddies of his from the gym who were black guys. <laughs> the cost of that was millions of dollars. Rahm Emanuel yeah. attempted to bill Smollett just for the overtime for right. the patrol officers involved, and it was $130,000. So, I mean, the amount of hour time, salary time for the brass, the amount of time spent patrolling that area, I mean, $8 million is an estimate I've heard in the Chicago papers. So that's the cost of one of these incidents. I mean, this went on for two months. Now, what do we lose in terms of actually getting to a point where there are no hate crimes? You know, maybe we've improved some of our race relations. You see, you can put a dollar amount on that, you know. But what have we also, what has the hoax itself done in terms of, you know, all the nice white people out there that now have a reason to believe more on the 
the Ann Coulter right wing side of the equation where this is all, you know, false versus the extreme left wing where, you know, we need to take all of these cases seriously. Because what has this done to the public's perception of the issue? Not well, just I the fact I'm, that now we're thinking we're thinking Chicago is this violent place. We would never have a reason to believe that. But you got you're describing some parts of this of that city that if you're not from Chicago, you don't know that. But now we've reinforced this image of Chicago that isn't maybe really the actuality, but all the other perception issues that we've touched on, you know? Yeah, I think a hoax like Smollett's, that's a good question. I mean, a hoax like Smollett's, as we've just discussed, costs millions of dollars in money. It costs more than that probably in goodwill. I think one point that you made there that's interesting is an obvious point that you rarely hear on the political left, but most white people are not in this day and age racist. And I think that this is kind of the, I thought the nice white people line was funny, but this is true. So <laughs> this is kind of the good white people. This well, is very <laughs> white people. But I mean. Coming to you from Alabama. Of, I'm sorry? <laughs> Coming at you from Alabama. <laughs> yeah. All right. Where they recently uh, took Arthur off the air because the talking rat in the show married his boyfriend. Okay. <laughs> You know, a lot of a lot of great things about the state, from football to the weather, political climate's not always one of them. But anyway, I mean, I'm from Kentucky, so I can make the same jokes there just with a wider group of people. I mean, it, and both of those are great American states. It's just as easy to make fun of San Francisco, and I don't know if they contribute more to the country. But getting into all this, I think that the great unspoken reality of American race relations is actually that they're going fairly well. If you look at American history, of course, of course, we had a tragic history of racial conflict. You know, the last Indian raid, I believe, was in the 19 teens. Whites, blacks, natives, Mexicans, we conquered half of Mexico and it was the half of most of the paved roads. Spent a fair amount of time butchering each other. Yeah, that's correct. But at the same time, it's also true that America desegregated fairly forcibly in 1954, although it took some time to implement that. Speaking as a lawyer, Racism's been formally, civilly, and criminally illegal since, or law school graduate, I don't practice, but civilly and criminally illegal since 1965, the Civil Rights Act. Affirmative action dates back to 1969 with the Philadelphia Plan. So, I mean, when I applied to law school, I received about a 20-point LSAT advantage, I would say, over equally qualified white competitors. That doesn't make up for slavery, but it's silly to pretend slavery is still going on. In reality, as an upper middle class African American, you have a substantial advantage anytime you apply for a Fortune 1000 job, anytime you apply to a graduate school. That's simply reality. And whites have been fairly good about accepting this, in fact. So, I mean, for at least some period of time. So, there is no race war in the United States. One of the most questioned statistics that I have in hoax, and also one of the most obviously valid, is that interracial crime is extraordinarily rare. If you look at serious crimes like murder, 94% of black murder victims, 85 to 86% of white murder victims are killed by someone of the same race, generally someone they knew. Uh, the person most likely to kill you is your ex-wife, or I suppose for women, your ex-husband. So in reality, there's not a massive amount of racial clashing that goes on in the United States. And this sounds extraordinarily counterintuitive because the media constantly promotes racial conflict as ongoing. This is true on the left and on the right. But in terms of hate crimes, there are less than 7,000 hate crimes in a typical year. I mean, there are 12 million crimes in a year. If you're looking at burglaries, fist fights between tough black and Irish American guys, generally both within the same race, car wrecks, DUIs. So all of the hate is concentrated in this category of seven or 8,000 incidences. We don't have an enormous issue with race war or racial violence. One of the things that we do have is a fairly large sector of society that benefits from people thinking that we do. So there are entire social institutions from ongoing affirmative action, which now applies not simply to blacks, but to all quote unquote people of color with the sometime exception of East Asians. Uh, minority set-asides, I often joke on the radio that I could buy a radio station for about half price. That's not really a joke at all. The budgets of the giant activist groups, Southern Poverty Law Centers, at about a half billion dollars just in the endowment. All of this rests on the idea that there is consistent, continued ethnic conflict. And so does the entire alt-right, by the way, which runs these panicked stories about black crime constantly. 
almost any situation in which either a white or black woman is killed by members of the other racial group is guaranteed to be a national front page news story. But the reality is that those situations are remarkably, remarkably rare. So I think, in fact, there is not a major problem with epidemic racial conflict in the USA, although there's certainly more than residual racism. I think that the issue is with the promotion by the political, quote unquote, sides of almost false narratives, as we talked about with hate crime earlier. And obviously, hate crimes contribute to that. So I'm gonna, I'll say bluntly, the majority of hate crimes, even if not by a very substantial margin, occurred. I am not attempting to say that all hate crimes are fakes. No one who's not a hack would say that. However, if you have the majority of the high-profile recent incidents, and it is the majority of the high-profile cases, Jussie Smollett, Yasmin Saweed, the burning of Hopewell Baptist, we went through Air Force Academy, if those turn out to be fakes after months of coverage, it's going to be very, very easy for partisans on one side to say, these are all quack jobs. None of this is real. And that's what really hurts race relations. I'd like to see the media actually cover what's happening in the country. It might be naive to say that. But I think that from an empirical standpoint, the most time and ink should be devoted to the things that harm the most people. An obvious example would be suicide among our veterans. That was, I believe, 16,000 men and women last year. Uh, car wreck. We refuse to build any sort of effective train line or tram line system in the USA just for no damn reason. So 50,000 people every year are killed just tooling around the highway. Uh, opiates. There are real problems in the country, and specifically in uh, my state and yours, Richard. I mean, opiate epidemic is devastating. Yeah. That's not really focused on as much as all this bullshit, shark attack, terrorism, People being small children being kidnapped. These are horrifying stories, of course, but you have to ask how many people are eaten by sharks? Yeah. Yeah. And it sucks for those people, but you know what? <laughs> I'm not sure if that needs to make national news. <laughs> yeah. No, that's some powerful stuff because I, I do think, I think that you're correct. And the thing is, too, like how many people in the United States actually live very peaceful, stable, secure lives Almost in all. terms of in terms of race relations. Now, sure, people deal with economic anxiety and different social stress stressors and, and whatnot. But in terms of race, like our race problem might be overblown, yes. <laughs> especially considering our history, you know, but but I'm, I'm hearing I'm hearing a scholar tell me that things are not quite as bad as they've been, and maybe they're improving, as it yeah. turns out. And but the perception jump. is the exact opposite. And then, Rich, yes. let me validate what you're saying, because you and I have seen this in our work in conflict zones, and I saw it in Iraq as well before I met Rich. The specter of violence, the specter of racial problems is significantly larger. I totally believe you're saying that, uh, Dr. Riley, because... We saw the same thing with, with the specter of violence and threat in a place like Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not saying those places weren't dangerous. Matter of fact, they are dangerous. But the day-to-day -day life of the standard Afghan was not spent on the edge of life and death. At any given moment in time, absolutely. But it, the specter was significantly larger than the actual threat of what was happening. Yeah, I think... I don't think there's much doubt about this, honestly. And I've done it, as I understand you guys have done some work about the culture of fear in America. So first, you're absolutely right. Even if you're in a third world country, quote unquote, the large majority of the time you're going to spend loving your wife, planting your crops, you know, perhaps going to the city to work. Um, I never went the military route. I respect it greatly. You did. Many people do. But I mean, I spent, I traveled solo through much of Latin America uh, late 90s, early 00s, I was an AFS volunteer, for example. I've been to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala. And there's no comparison of, first of all, life there is peaceful most of the time. Secondarily, there's no comparison of a third world favela with anything in America. <laughs> Amer Americans who behave as though their life is full of trouble and strife. Um, I can say, just having been to those countries, anyone who's a soldier can say to a greater extent, are bullshitting. They're, they're very often whining. There is, most of life is not full of horror and turmoil, and very little of American life is. So what you see in some of the most peaceful places on earth, American collegiate campuses and so on, is this tendency to take tiny incidents and amplify them into massive stories. 
And that's what a lot of these quote unquote hate crimes are. Someone left a banana on the front door of the wealthy African-American fraternity house, that kind of thing. <laughs> so yeah, the, my very strong opinion is that racial conflict is greatly, conflict in general is greatly exaggerated in one of the world's most peaceful, plumpest <laughs> societies. Yeah. We have a media that exists, and I'm not entirely brutalizing this, but in contrast with, say, the BBC model, we have a media that exists as an ad delivery vehicle. Yeah. So the stories that are presented in the media are those that will attract clicks and rewatches and that will get people to buy Viagra pills and Silverado pickup trucks. That's a fact. That's what the entire business model is. And there are very consistent themes here, like you are sexually inadequate which is the front cover of every women's magazine and most of the men's. Uh, your children are going to be taken away. You are going to experience the atavistic terror of being eaten by an animal. You are going to have to fight the tough people of the other color. Both blacks and whites remember history, the Klan against the Panthers are terrified of this, but yeah. it's not happening now. And that is important. And, and we're going to persecute you for your religious beliefs. Oh, yeah, that, that is one of the most ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I lean a bit right, but one of the fantasy stories that's going on right now is this idea that Islam is coming to America. Yeah, it is. Um, but the <laughs> Sharia law is going to be implemented. You have states like Oklahoma passing laws against Sharia. I mean, the percentage of the population in the United States that's made up of practicing Muslims, you guys might correct this, but I think it's 0.7%. So, no, no one's coming for the Christmas trees. No one is going to kill your children. They're not going to take your aren't going to attack Dubuque. Yeah. And the left is responsible for some of this. The right's responsible for some of it. I do think the left is responsible for the fairy tales about racism. This episode of The Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter. At Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG 69 At The Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. I do think the left is responsible for the fairy tales about racism. You know, there's, there's a lot to be said for that, too, because when you look at the news and if you were to ask someone what's happened to current events the last three years, not one person would talk about any Nobel Prize winners. They wouldn't talk about scientific advances that don't get covered in the press. They certainly wouldn't talk about all of our most recent peer reviewed published papers, but they would be able to tell you about all the Trump things and everything, you know, all these other things, or, or they would complain about, and this is not an endorsement of the president. I always have to say that, but they would complain about, Oh, secretary DeVos and, and how she's terrible at education without any capacity to have a conversation about any previous secretary of education and their success or failure. They just know that they hate that. And, and that's what the news peddles in is this hate. And, you know, really, I feel I often don't watch the news at all. And I usually feel less informed when I do, because I think, why is a shark tag, you know, news? Yeah. Right. It's just not <laughs> newsworthy. It's a it's a it's a random thing that happens. I don't know. Let's say 18 times a year when someone gets chomped and dies in America. And then if you want to talk about. And I'm on my soapbox a little bit, everybody. I apologize. You want to talk about dealing with plastic in the United States. We have pretty good at capturing our plastic. Are we perfect? No. But if you want to have an impact dollar for dollar, fly to the Horn of Africa with a bunch of garbage bags and just start filling them up there. Infinitely more successful. And I promise you that's the case. I tend to agree. The environment is, again, one of the great undiscussed issues, except for the screaming at the fringes. And again, there's kind of a natural tendency to focus on what's not too terrifying, what you're used to, what you feel you can stop. So there are entire stories that really are never discussed, like the possibility of meteorites hitting the planet. Yeah. Um, Which is a my, real possibility. Is my understanding is that NASA estimates we're going to have what's called a system destroyer sometime in the next 2,000 years. And we might or might not be ready for it because we don't know when it's going to arrive. <laughs> And this has happened before. If you look at things like the real explanation for the tectonic glass on a few feet under most layers of soil. So at any point, asteroids or whatever the technical term is could hit the planet and kill us all. 
we have no preparations in place for this. And our space agency says it's probably going to happen. Yeah. It's clearly happened before, but there's no point in promoting that story. There's nothing that can quickly, decisively be done to solve that potential problem. And there's no way that story is going to make people buy the car or the pill. So instead, you get the specific short-term fear that people can understand and process quickly. And it also gets magnified by, you know, the social media noise. I'm, I'm going to go back to what I was harping on earlier, because I know a lot of this hoax stuff, you know, it, it'll get driven by the Twitter and the Facebook and the, uh, the, the whatever's, whatever the kids are doing these days, you know, and it's hard to have a decent conversation, you know, at a high level where people agree on the terms, you know, their, their concepts, they understand the measurement techniques. They understand the analysis techniques. So uh, until we, we can first agree on what some of the common problems are, like, yes, there will be a freaking asteroid that's going to fly out of the sky. And I don't know if we've got, like, do we shoot a laser at it or do we send a nuke? I don't know. You know, Maybe but there's still a lot of problems, though. It's a lot of things like get back where we talk about this race stuff, you know, for the most part, most Americans are not going to be victims of a, you know, a, a cross race crime, whatever the proper terminology is. But yet there's the perception that is it's really we got a lot of people that are kept scared and kept frightened by the other. And there's race, you know, bring in gender and sexuality, bring in religion, bring in all this stuff. And, you know, the media perpetuating this this fear factor, you know, that's actually preventing it's the fear factor, I think, that if we're looking for a reason why we can't get along and kind of shrink the gap between rhetoric and reality, this fear factor really prevents us from finding out what our common terminology is, you know, figuring out that agreement reality, you know, not the mediated reality we get from our Twitter feeds and our Facebook, you know, but that agreement reality that we can agree. This is what, this is what the numbers show. This is what's happening. This is the empirical evidence. You know, I wanted to say real quick to Dr. Riley's book is called Hate Crime Hoax, How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War. You guys can buy that on Amazon. And, and here's the deal. For those of you who don't know, when you buy a book on Amazon to help the author out, of course, you bought the book. That's great. But rate it and review it. So give it five stars. Give a review. That helps other people find the book. I, I can't stress this enough. If you want to support what Dr. Riley's doing, that is the best way to do it. I, I want to ask you a little bit more about some of your other stuff in race. Your $50 million book is uh, the $50 million question is, is an interesting topic. And, and we've talked about white privilege, but when you looked at the $50 million question, you were kind of challenging or expanding on the work done in the mid nineties by another person. Can you talk a little bit more about that so we can kind of dig in? Yeah, actually one uh, very quick comment. I'd like to respond to what Rich said about the media and fear. Please. And this is the last thing about the fear stuff, but I don't think we're overhyping the effect of the media here. One of the things you've seen really emphatically in the past 30 years is that, and we're all old enough to remember that. Again, I don't want to assume you guys can identify as seven or whatever. But, um, <laughs> I, I, I really- identify as a Puerto Rican man who's six foot three, six pack abs, throws 102 miles an hour, and is wealthy. <laughs> that is what I am. Just so you know. I identify as a sushi burrito myself. I love a sushirito. Sushiritos are great. But okay, so the media, there we really have seen the closing or the shortening of the news cycle. I've seen both terms used in the literature. But I mean, for a very long time, dating back to the 70s, for example, if you're talking about, you know, Cronkite and kind of the old bulls there, you had news once a day for an hour. Mm. It was reasonably well done. It was the truly big events. You might see an interview with Yasser Arafat or something like that, and that was it. You know, the Japanese emperor is visiting the USA. Okay, round of slow claps. It was that sort of thing. Then in the 80s, you saw the development of, I I guess TNT really was one of the first cable resources, Turner's business. Mm -hmm. But you saw the development of what very rapidly TNT Fox became very news focused. So you had the cable newsers, and then you had news on perhaps 12 hours a day, interspersed with punditry. Now, with social media, you can't escape the goddamn news. (laughs) If you go... Onto your computer to check the baseball scores. Everything you see is going to be, you know, first white baseball player to kneel happened yesterday. You know, in the same city, (laughs) once you click on an article from a city, what are the horrific murders in that city? What's the racial conflict in that city? Are they marching? And you start thinking, why would I ever want to go there? You know, in reality, if you went to that city, if you went to Little Rock, 
during the worst periods of gang violence or Chicago during the biggest Black Lives Matter Occupy marches, 99% of the pleasant tourist district you were in would be the same as it had ever been. You would have absolutely no negative experiences, but we don't see that now because of the shortened closed news cycle. Every day, every minute, I, I get Facebook and Twitter updates on my phone as I'm starting to grow those profiles. So every minute I see something like 10 more people like you, but someone got killed horribly. So that obviously affects how we see the world. Um, so that actually, the way this ties into my research, I'm not just rambling on, I wrote an article, the standard mid-level journal, solid piece, but it was called Hearts All at Twitter. And I look at how exposure to social media impacts fear. So I asked people, I did a quantitative survey of maybe 500 people, and I asked them, how aware are you of just these horrific incidents that fell along racial lines? The Michael Brown shooting, Trayvon Martin in his hoodie, but I also threw in white cases to be balanced. I mean, Kate Steinle being murdered by an illegal immigrant. Uh, I don't know if you remember this case. It didn't fit the narrative rapidly vanished from the media, but a uh, angry black former anchor walked into a TV station and shot two colleagues on air. Wow. I asked about that one. <laughs> yeah, remarkably short tenure for that story. Yeah. But um, I asked people how aware they were of these horrible incidents. And I also asked people how fearful they were. I mean, a series of questions like, how comfortable would you be walking through a typical integrated working middle class neighborhood at night? Would you say that America is a crime ridden place, strongly agree down to strongly disagree? And without going in depth about the regressions and cross tabulations and so on, I found an incredibly strong, statistically significant at 0 0.001 correlation between just exposure to social media and one, awareness of these horrible incidents, and two, fear. So there's an argument to be made for turning, I'm hardly, the paper's chock full of citations, I'm hardly the first to find this. This goes back to Glasner 1996, I mean, media exposure and fear. But I mean, so there's an argument to be made for turning off the TV quite often. The more you're exposed to this crap, the angrier, the more tense you're gonna be. And yeah. it's designed on an addiction model, right? Like, do you really need to wait exactly five seconds and then tell me each one of my likes? <laughs> like, couldn't you once a day say you've got 36 people that read the article? Well, sure you could. <laughs> but that, that's like how you design a cigarette. You constantly lift it to your mouth. That's how addiction <laughs> happens. You know, every 30 seconds, someone's going to argue with you or love you. And because I debate the alt-right and the hard left, I get crazy messages. Like people tell me they want to sleep with me. They want to kill me. Just nonsense. But every minute I'll get someone like, I want to bleep or kill you. And I am very <laughs> wired into this system that tells me these things. So turn it off. But uh, my other research... The $50 million question is a book with these small academic press scholars. So this is not something that's been selling as much as hoax, nor should it be. But um, it's a book with an academic press that began as my doctoral dissertation. And what I do there is test a question that Andy Hacker asked back in 1992. So Andrew Hacker became very famous. The fame of his book, Two Nations, didn't really start fading until around 2006, 2008. But he became very famous for a book arguing that racism is still ongoing. But one of the questions he asked in that book, he took a small in pool of students who are mostly white guys from Queens, New York, and he asked them how much they would have to be paid to become black. And it's, it's a genuinely interesting question. The, the average answer is $50 million. So Hacker took this to indicate the value of white status in a racist society, something he says explicitly. This is one of, along with the Invisible Knapsack, this is one of the first publications that look at white privilege. So for my dissertation, I was interested in whether this really has anything to do with white privilege, since we're in college of the affirmative action era, or whether people simply value their identities. So I designed this entire experiment that tested quote unquote value of whiteness theory versus standard theories of in-group identification. And the end game of this was that I asked a bunch of people into the thousands how much they'd have to be paid to change four core characteristics, race, sex, sexual orientation, and religion if they had a sincere religious belief. And I found a bunch of interesting things. First of all, whites, again, said they'd have to be paid 50 to 60 million to change their identity. But the flip side of that was that blacks said they'd have to be paid about 80 million. <laughs> um, and both groups expressed negative stereotypes of the other. I wouldn't receive affirmative benefits if I was white. I wouldn't be able to dance if I was white. Would I have to dress like them? Both groups, and whites and blacks at Southern Illinois U University get along very well. So both groups are kind of trolling each other like, no, I don't want to wear a size 5X jersey. 
like the black guys. I'll leave out the brothers. I wear a polo shirt. Some of it was funny. Some of it was mean. But both groups said, no, I'm not going to change my identity. That's point one. The most racist, if you define this as racist at all, and I don't, but the most racist groups in America are in order older Asian men and young black women. Whites finish about midway down the list. So that's finding one. Finding two is that people value a bunch of stuff more than race. So in terms of changing my race, if you actually, the, the question was how much money would you have to be paid, assuming this is a valid question, you know, assuming you could do this. Uh, in all honesty, if you brought me a suitcase with $10 million in it and said, will you be white? I would say, yeah. I mean, I don't care. Sure. I'm going to buy a big house and then I'll live in it as a white guy, whatever. But I mean, the things that people wouldn't, and that was a common reaction among males. The things that people wouldn't change were in order sexual orientation and sex. And you, you don't want to get into a realm of being glib with this, but if you ask a bunch of men, hey, would you change to become a submissive homosexual tomorrow for X amount of money, many men are going to say, no, I would not, sir. <laughs> so that was the most notable conclusion. People did not want to be gay. Gay people didn't want to be straight. I mean, they had some comments about what oral sex with a woman would be like, for example. <laughs> Um, you know, it, people don't want to change that. People didn't want to change their sex. Virtually no women wanted to be men. Yeah. So I found a virtually no support for the hypothesis that self-identification is tied into sort of dominant group status. The idea of white privilege seems largely unsupported. Uh, black people are as self-confident as whites. They are as proud of being black as whites are being white, in fact, a bit more so in both cases. So yeah, just no evidence found for that. I did find some interesting things. Uh, religious people are becoming more ecumenical. Most religious people would change at least some aspect of their faith for about a million dollars. People often said things like, these are basically the same, we all have one God. So it's, it's hard to imagine the same responses coming from people during, say, the Crusades versus Jihad era. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that was the book, The $50 Million Question. I look at why people value yeah. identity. And I kind of practice with my methodologies because I'm getting out of grad school and I want to show off to potential mm. employers. I do a list experiment. Well, I mean, those are fun stuff in there. Massively multivariate regressions. I tried to sneak in a time series, but my panel said, you know, you're doing this over two years. There's no way that's legitimate. <laughs> you're not here to do math exercises. So I did. That was that was the book. This is the funny thing, though, because Rich and I deal with uh, the, what I call the ground truth, right? Like ground truth is the reality when you go into you know, Platte River, Kansas, and you start having a conversation. And uh, so at the time we were doing some of this stuff, I was I was in Kansas City, Missouri area, and we were looking into torture and like Abu Ghraib and all those scandals. Okay. And this guy, this guy says to me, super clear and candid, like the ground truth often is, he's like, anything someone would pay to have sexually done to them cannot be torture. There you go. Well. It, it, <laughs> It I don't creates know about a real that. clear line, you know? I don't know about that at all. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm sure people would pay to, I mean, people do frequently pay to have anal sex in gay brothels. I mean, if I'm overseas in an advising role and I'm captured, I hope this isn't going to happen. <laughs> you know, I, I disagree with that. I don't think that's valid at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah either way, he, urinated on. I mean, there are plenty of yeah. war crimes that someone would pay to have done, perhaps, in the privacy of their own home. I don't, I don't know about that one. Yeah, but that guy's got a perception, and you're not going to change his yeah, perception. The, yeah, the, re, yeah, the thing is, the ground truth, like, that is a reality that's there for that person. And and it, does, it doesn't validate it for everybody, as you're saying. But when you hear things from the ground truth, they do, have a, they do lend a clarity where you're like, okay, I've got to get by this, whatever this is, whatever that thing is. And this racial stuff is interesting because we do struggle at least – mentally with what race is and, and what race isn't. And one of the things we hear a lot of is that being a racist is about power, but you're saying that you don't, you didn't find that. Well, I think that, so there are two levels there. First of all, I don't think anyone would disagree that blacks and whites, if you read the research going back to say Snyderman and Carmine's 1997 in politics, no one would deny that blacks and whites display similar levels of racial hostility. Blacks sometimes test as higher than whites. So I think that what you're talking about is, in my opinion, a leftist dodge, uh, just as there are some rightist dodges. But that's just the attempt to say, OK, we're racist, but we're not really. So that's that's something a little different. The argument is that you can't be racist unless you have prejudice plus power. And my counterpoint to that would be, well, then the Klan can't be racist. I mean, this is a group of spectacularly powerless people. 
They're specifically distinguished from the rest of the white community by the epithets deep southerner, white trash. There's no argument that this is a power base somehow linked to the northern white power base in this country. Are you saying that a Klansman can't be a bigot? What about one of the many Klansmen who's half native, if you insist on this sort of minority purity? And at that point, the opposing debater will probably say, okay, let's agree to disagree, that's a good point. But I've never seen any validity to the argument that you can't be racist unless you're a member of a temporarily dominant group. I mean, imagine that in, for example, South Africa, where the blacks and whites frequently flip the power position. And where there are more than one group of whites, by the way, they're Englishmen, Boers, South African Jews, all of these groups, I don't want to say hate each other, that's a functioning second world country, but Zulus and Boers haven't liked each other for a really long time if you read military history. So are you only racist as opposed to ineffectively personally prejudiced in years when the Zulu party wins against the Afrikaner party? That doesn't make any sense in the international arena. That to me is kind of an attempt to say, okay, look, the Black Panthers aren't like the Klan because of this excuse we're going to make. I think that's something that's come out of American domestic politics. I mean, in reality, if I could add one thing to that, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I mean, the reality is that the crazy hard left, if you're talking about the Nation of Islam, uh, the New Panthers and the Black Panthers, Black Bloc, the actual fighters for Occupy and Black Lives Matter. I mean, I just now got to Antifa, Animal Liberation Front, Earth Liberation Front, the Astalan movement, the woke gangs, if you read Vice Lord Lit, El Rukin Lit. I mean, those guys are as nutty as anyone on the right. There's no practical moral distinguisher between El Rukin or the Nation of Islam on the one hand and the Klan on the other. So this argument that only one of these groups can display significant prejudice, I, I just don't agree with. No, I think, well, I guess my view of the literature, you can have, you can have prejudice on any side of the political spectrum. Yes, yeah, of course. You know, and that's it's just all these left wing groups. I mean, I, I do see them as kind of nowadays as a reaction to the right wing groups. But to go back to the social media thing and the perception things like how it, it, I think it's kind of hard to get through to some people who are who would call themselves members of these groups or part of these movements to understand that they maybe sometimes their thoughts and feelings are grounded in what's not the reality. <laughs> you know, like the reality of these hoaxes, you know, these, it's, if I believe something that's not true, that I guess doesn't make my belief not valid, it just means anybody who's trying to reach out to me has got a harder fucking time reaching yeah. out to me, you know? Well, yeah, I think this gets into the whole idea of my lived experience and so yeah. on. Yeah, and this, because discourse in America tends to be dominated by the left, if you look at the NGO sector, the media, academia, there's more of a reluctance to criticize left-wing nonsense beliefs than right-wing nonsense beliefs. And there's no shortage of left-wing nonsense beliefs. I mean, when you see people at the most recent Women's March walking around in hijabs and burqas talking about how feminist Islam is, that strikes me as an empirically challengeable point. Yes. But I mean, more broadly, many of these points are. Uh, Black Lives Matter's contentions come to mind, where the argument is generally said verbatim, the police kill thousands of mostly innocent black people per year. The reality, of course, is that only about 1,200 people in a typical year are shot by police at all. About 200 to 250 of them are going to be black. Uh, in the year I use for review in hoax, uh, the total number of unarmed black men shot by white cops was 17. So, I mean, those are facts. But if you say those facts to someone who's on the hard left, yeah, you're probably going to get an angry, a hostile response. I don't really think that there's anything you can do but keep saying the facts. Just as it's true that if you add in Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq, Caucasian Palestine, Caucasian countries aren't necessarily any more peaceful or higher IQ than any other countries. It's also, and that's a point against the hard right, it's also true that cops don't kill 10,000 people a year. So if you pull up hard statistical data from any of our three fields and someone looks at it and says, well, no, that's bullshit, I'm living my dream, there's not much you can do except, you know, go talk to the next guest at the cocktail party or take the question from the next questioner at the debate. Like, it's hard to change a fanatic's mind, but you have to be very aware of what the facts are in order for you to set positions in your mind. Yeah, and I think also for some people who, and this is one of the one of the benefits of an education, specifically higher education, the ability to understand when you're having a conversation, there's a difference between my experience, but then also the experience of, uh, let's say, my people, 
to go back to what I said, the good white people. <laughs> How's the experience of the good white people in this part of the world? You know, that may or may not be the same as my individual predicament. You know, so again, we, we've got this, this levels of analysis issue. Like, are we talking about the issue as it pertains to individuals? Are we talking about as it pertains to individuals who are members of a group? Are we dealing with a group phenomenon? You know, because I totally, I'm like, this this hate crime hoax stuff just, it, it fascinates me, you know. Um, but, you know, that it, it doesn't mean to say, like, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about maybe we aren't, maybe we don't have as much problem with race as we think we do. Now, that doesn't detract from some of the other points, like, yes, Black people and white people in society are still treated differently in the economic system. You know, perhaps there are some broader, more aggregate level differences that we can point to. So what is, what is that kind of levels of analysis issue, like me versus the experiences of my group? How does that come into play with some of this stuff? I think that's an excellent question. I think there are really two things there. So I'm actually going to take a quick note here. The two things I wrote down were the individual versus the group and be multivariate. So one, like, and this is my bias, like virtually everyone with a business background, virtually everyone on the center, right? I prefer to think of people as individuals. And my quantitative training has strengthened that because with every individual, there are so many variables, IQ, LOA, level of aggression, social class, social class, social class, social class. But I mean, attractiveness, appearance, you know, urban, rural, which we ignore, north, south, which we ignore, so many things that are going to predict your probable position that you generally have no veteran status, did a relative die, birth order. There's so many things that are going to affect how happy and wealthy you're likely to be in a particular set of years that looking at someone and assuming is almost a waste of time. I mean, you could say at the one level, the univariate level, well, someone's Jewish. That means they're more likely to be wealthy. Well, Jewish from where? The south side of Chicago? <laughs> I mean, if your dad owns a corner store in Bridgeport, you're not a millionaire, man. You might be the richest guy on that block. But it's relevant to know someone's Jewish American. It's also relevant to know they're Jewish American from the south side. Mm. Both of those facts are relevant. And without knowing both of those facts, you really have no betting insight on where someone's coming from. So, I mean, for example, to me, the idea that I'm going to distinguish prejudice from racism a bit. But the idea that you can't be racist and powerful if you're a member of a minority group, racist and powerful, that just comes from a false disaggregation or a false confusion of the individual and the group level of analysis. Mm -hmm. So it's true that because of both racism and problematic culture, the average black guy makes whatever it is, 40, 43% of black guys make more than the average white guy. Okay. So only 43% of African-Americans, I'm sure this changes year by year, are over the white median in terms of income. So that indicates there's a systemic problem we need to fix, sure. But that also means that almost 45% of black guys are richer and more powerful than the average white guy. So if you meet a black guy, he's got a 4.5 out of 10 chance of being the more powerful person in an interaction with a white guy. Just saying black guys can't be racist is meaningless because almost 50% of the black guys can be racist as hell. There's no <laughs> logical <laughs> argument there. So you can say, yeah, we need to fix the 7%. And also, if you're a black guy, as I am in the top 45%, don't be an asshole, just as we would to a white guy. I mean, that seems very self-evident to me. So I've already kind of covered my second point. But the second point is just multivariate analysis. If you look at people, you'll find there are about 20 predictor variables that determine where you're going to end up in life. And a lot of them we don't even think about, like veteran status. As you guys know very well, being in the military can be an advantage in terms of the training you get. It can also be a disadvantage if you're a tip of the spear guy, you experience PTSD, you come back. I mean, that either one of those is going to dramatically influence your earnings. Birth order. Firstborn children make a lot more than seventh sons. Uh, IQ. As taboo as it is to say this, how smart and aggressive you are is one of the biggest predictors of success in life. The biggest predictor of success in life is how rich your parents are. Uh, no. rural That's the one? <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it's, we forget class when we talk about race because there's this very racist assumption on the left that black people are poor. No, black people are 7% or whatever we just settled on more likely to be poor. And that's due to racism as well as some crap cultural mistakes we've made. 
But I mean, I'm sitting here in a suit coat and you guys are teasing me about it. It would be stupid <laughs> to tell me that I'm poor and I have to understand I'm poor because I'm black. I could try to repeat over and over like, no, I think I'll hit a million this year. I just wrote a book. And the left-wing commentator could keep saying, nope, you're oppressed, you poor Negro. <laughs> so I mean, you need to be multivariate. You need to be aware of all this stuff. I tend to think also second level of this, it's a little more conflicted in the discipline, but I tend to think that when you adjust for characteristics other than race, most gaps that are attributed to race go away. Hmm. Tom Sowell, who's obviously on the right, moving toward the hard right, but who's very respected for having done this for decades, has whole books about this, like discrimination and disparities. But uh, to take an example that's from a much more mainstream source, Department of Labor, all Sowell's great. But I mean, Department of Labor looked at what predicts earnings, and they found that black men on average earn 82.2% of what white men do. But then the lead economist on the project, who is black, said, well, we need to adjust for some things. And they adjusted first for age. Uh, black, black Americans are a young population. The average black guy was, I think, 23. That could easily be wrong. The average white guy, 35. So hopefully, unless you're a failure, between 23 and 35, you're going to dramatically change your income. I just hit the 35 mark. I mean, when I was 23, I don't want to say something like I was a chimp because that might be seen as racially loaded, but I was an idiot. I still had a state <laughs> for I was still in touch with my high school girlfriend. I mean, like, it, it, come on. <laughs> so 25, that's a different thing from 35 or 40 as a businessman. So you have to adjust for that. You have to adjust for region. Most black people live in the South. And in the South, in the Georgia suburbs, for example, black people do quite as well as white people, but wages overall are lower in the South. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust for Southern residency. So you're comparing whites and blacks in the North. You have to remove a couple of isolated ghettos. You have to adjust for education. And once you do all those things, I think the gap had closed to 98.1%. And that sounds about right. Like there's maybe a two to 5% gap that's just straight racism. Very problematic. We need to get rid of that. But it's just silly to look at this happens with men and women too. It's silly to compare a housewife with a CEO and say, look, women make less than men. You need to compare a female CEO with a male CEO. And there again, I guarantee you're going to get into a gap that's 1% or 7% or even that favors the woman. So be multivariate and look at individuals. I like it. Hey, listen, we've had you for about an hour and I don't want to keep you any longer than that, but I would love to have you come back on because, you know, I mean, this is awesome. This is what we need to hear is more of these things, more of these stories so we can get out of our head and get into the numbers and understand where the gaps really are, where the work really is. You know, yeah. if we're going to deal with that 7% gap or if, if we're going to be able to get along more because it turns out we're not as racist as we believe that we are, then that, that's one of the biggest things that this show is about is is just figuring out where the work actually is and calming the fuck down for a second and uh, getting into real land and, and not uh, not imagine land, not somebody else's agenda land, not advancing a political perspective over the, the good of the people. And I appreciate you, you taking the time to do that with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be glad to come back on. I appreciate you guys having me. Enjoyed talking to both of you. And I don't want to close with some X-File shit, like keep watching the skies and looking for knowledge. But really, with, with the figures we opened with that we all agreed on, if you watch a debate where someone says 0.03% of these cases are fakes, and someone else says 100% of them are fakes, John, and they're both on Fox <laughs> News, get the computer out and look. Go to the library. If you have any methods trading, crack open Stater, SPSS, test it. Look for facts and base your position on facts. That's all, that's all I got. That's not really that hard, though, but it's hard for some people. <laughs> yeah. or or just send just text me and go pete get dr rich and and dr wilfred dr will on the show and have those guys explain their shit to me because you know that's i want to hear from experts not not pundits i want to hear from people that really know what the hell they're talking about and are willing to be wrong you know i mean we <laughs> If you're not willing to be wrong and have your position evolved, I'm sorry, you're, you're obsolete already. So, Well, and we like to talk about complicated stuff and the things we talk about have layers and we like to talk about it in a very layered way. And I think that's what Dr. Riley helped us out with today. Well, thank you, gentlemen. 